Welcome everyone to Navigating the Alphabet Soup, FSA HSA Compliance Refresher. Thank you all so much for joining us. Our moderator for today's call is Beth Allen. She'll be answering the questions you sent through the Q&A today. We will try our best to answer all of your questions, but if for whatever reason we are unable to get your question today, please follow up with your advisor for further assistance. Today's presentation is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording in the follow-up website and on the NFP or in the follow-up email, excuse me, and on the NFP website. If there are any portions of this call that you missed, by Monday you receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's call. Joining us today are Carol Wood, Vice President and Counsel of Benefits Compliance at NFP, and Roger Abramson, Vice President and Counsel of Benefits Compliance at NFP. Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Amber, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today uh, for our presentation, Navigating the Alphabet Soup, an FSA and HSA compliance refresher. Uh, and here we are, our smiling faces. I'm Carol Wood, joined by my colleague, Roger Abramson. And before we begin, we just want to remind everybody that uh, this presentation is intended to be used for general guidance purposes only is not intended as tax or legal advice. Any questions regarding the application of the law to specific circumstances should always be addressed by your tax or legal counsel. The information is current as of today, May 17, 2023. We have an aggressive agenda today uh, since we're covering both uh, the, the health flexible spending account as well as the health savings account. Uh, we'll provide an overview and we'll discuss eligibility, contributions, distributions, um, throughout the presentation, I will include some frequently asked questions and also compliance nuances, and then there'll be some final takeaways. In with the overview, health FSAs and HSAs are both tax advantage health reimbursement accounts. They're designed to pay qualified medical expenses, generally meaning as defined by code section 213D, and they're coupled with a major medical plan. The HSA must be paired with a qualified high deductible health plan. The health FSA can be paired with any major medical plan. And these accounts help employees pay their medical plan cost sharing, deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance. Offered through a section 125 cafeteria plan, there are significant tax benefits. Uh, employee pre-tax deferrals are not subject uh, to payroll or income taxes. Distributions for qualifying expenses are not taxable. And for HSAs, interest and earnings on deposits are also not taxable. Uh, just a point, health FSA uh, contributions must be made through a cafeteria plan. HSA contributions can be made outside of a, a cafeteria plan. Um, employers can do so through a, a comparability formula or individuals can do so and then take an above the line deduction on their return. Um, but we're only going to be discussing today, our focus is really going to be on the HSA contributions that are made through a cafeteria plan or in the employer context, and most employers make their contributions through a cafeteria plan. Now, despite these differences, there, there are certain, uh, excuse me, despite these similar purposes of the FSAs and HSAs, uh, there are also some key differences between these accounts, which we'll review now. It's important to understand that a health FSA is a group health plan. It's a self-insured health plan that's sponsored by the employer normally, uh, the employer is setting the contribution level within the IRS limits, establishing the eligibility requirements, determining the plan year, uh, choosing design features, and the employer is ultimately responsible uh, for determining who is eligible, ensuring the contribution limits are not exceeded, the substantiation of expenses, and that's an important responsibility, and plan compliance with all applicable laws. Well, just what are those laws? Well, health FSA compliance with federal laws includes ERISA. Of course, we have the plan document, summary plan description, form 5500 filing obligations, fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, and you know that would be most plans. I do recognize the governmental and church plans that they may not be covered by ERISA, but the vast majority of plans are. Uh, COBRA, it is a group health plan, although the obligation is limited, as we'll discuss in most cases. Uh, the HIPAA privacy and security rules apply. Uh, FMLA has to be kept in mind. A participant can maintain their health FSA benefits during an FMLA leave. Um, 
With respect to the ACA, a health FSA is typically subject to some, but not all ACA requirements. Almost all health FSAs are designed as accepted benefits. Um, so certain ACA requirements, such as coverage of preventive services without cost sharing, prohibitions against lifetime and annual limits, do not apply. Um, but the code section 105 non-discrimination rules do apply. Uh, and of course, uh, the code section 125 cafeteria plan rules, uh, including the qualifying event rules, apply to health FSAs. By contrast, the, the employer HSA program generally is not a group health plan. And employees are particularly striving to make sure um, that it doesn't become an ERISA group health plan. Uh, so the employer to, do, to, to ensure that ERISA does not apply, the employer must limit their involvement. Specifically, the employee establishment of HSAs must be completely voluntary. Employers must not limit the ability of employees to transfer their funds to another HSA, impose any conditions on the use of HSA funds, make or influence HSA investment decisions, represent that the HRAs are an ERISA group health plan. And I think you have to be careful with enrollment materials here because you are presenting other benefits that are subject to ERISA. Um, the employer also can't receive any payment or compensation in connection with an HSA. Uh, so you shouldn't be receiving more favorable terms uh, for a loan from a bank uh, because you brought your HSA program to them. That would be a prohibited transaction. Uh, remember, of course, that although the HSA program is not subject to ERISA, the underlying, the HDHP plan is a group health plan uh, that must comply with all of these laws. Uh, and also the HSA program offered through a cafeteria plan is subject to the cafeteria plan rules, including non-discrimination rules. So it's not a group health plan. What is the HSA? It's really just an individually owned account. The account terms are governed by a deposit agreement with the HSA custodian, who's responsible for safeguarding the funds. Um, the employee owns the account, sets the contribution level, and determines any investments. Uh, the employee is free to transfer that HSA to another custodian. Uh, and they, importantly, the employee can maintain the account after employment ends. So it's portable. Employee is ultimately responsible for determining their own eligibility, making contributions within the applicable limits. And keep in mind, the limits always apply on a calendar year basis. That's regardless of, of the, the HDHP plan year. Uh, the employees responsible for making sure the funds are used for qualified medical expenses, uh, maintaining records of their expenditures should the IRS ever question it, tax reporting on Form 8889, that's the company's their Form 1040, um, correction of excess contributions, hopefully there aren't any, but if there are. Um, now the employer, although they're not ultimately responsible uh, for for eligibility and everything else, uh, they should work closely with the HSA custodian to educate employees uh, regarding their obligations. Okay, let's move forward onto eligibility and we'll start with health FSA eligibility. And there's a few basic rules to keep in mind here. The first is the footprint rule. Uh, the eligibility footprints of a health FSA cannot be broader than that of the major medical plan, uh, meaning employees eligible for the health FSA must also be eligible for the group major medical plan. It's not necessary that the employees actually enroll in the medical plan, they just need to be eligible. Um, so part-time employees who are ineligible for the major medical plan, uh, they should not be eligible to to, excuse me, participate in the health FSA. Uh, the reverse is allowed though. You can have people eligible for the major medical plan um, who aren't eligible for the health FSA, but you do need to keep in mind then the non-discrimination rules, which we'll be discussing momentarily. So what is the reason for the footprint rule? Well, if the employer offered a health FSA without also offering a major medical plan to certain employees, then the health FSA would not qualify as an accepted benefit. And as we discussed earlier, that's important because we don't want the health FSA to be subject to 
all the ACA requirements, coverage of preventive services without cost sharing that quite frankly, the health FSA could not independently comply with. The other rules to keep in mind with eligibility are the section 105 and 125 non-discrimination rules. Uh, health FSAs must satisfy the Section 105 non-discrimination rules uh, because they're self-insured plans. Health FSAs and also HSAs must satisfy the Section 125 non-discrimination rules applicable to pre-tax benefits. And in general, these rules are designed to prevent discrimination in eligibility as well as contributions and benefits that disproportionately favor key or highly compensated employees. And I won't go through the specific definitions, they vary slightly uh, between the two sets of rules, but the general idea again is that we don't wanna favor disproportionately in favor of the highly compensated. So employers should consider these rules when designing their eligibility terms, um, particularly when they're considering class exclusions um, and they, they you know, should try to stay away from any varying waiting periods. What about owner eligibility? Is a business owner eligible to participate in a health FSA? And the answer here is no. A health FSA is offered through a cafeteria plan. Generally, only employees and former employees can participate. Uh, so self-employed individuals, which include a sole proprietor, a partner, a more than 2% shareholder in an S corporation, they cannot participate in a health FSA. Uh, members of a limited liability corporation treated as a partnership for tax purposes also normally cannot participate. So employers should be careful not to allow these individuals um, to participate in the cafeteria plan, which could jeopardize the tax advantage status uh, of the entire plan. I want to discuss the last item on health FSA eligibility is COBRA eligibility. Um, we said earlier that health FSAs are subject to COBRA, um, but most are, most are designed as accepted benefits and therefore they qualify for a limited COBRA obligation. Um, this means that generally COBRA must only be offered to those with underspent accounts where their contributions exceed reimbursements. Of course, those are the only folks who'd be interested in COBRA uh, for the duration of the plan year in which the qualifying event occurs. However, if a health FSA allows carryovers, the health FSA must allow carryovers by COBRA beneficiaries for the maximum COBRA period. As an example, Bella participates in a calendar year health FSA and elects 2,400 in salary deferrals for 2023. She defers $1,200 and submits $200 in reimbursable expenses prior to her to her employment termination mid-year on June 30th, 2023. If the health FSA has no carryover feature, Bella can only elect COBRA through the end of the year. But if the health FSA allows carryovers, Bella can carry over any remaining balance at the end of the year uh, and submit eligible expenses for reimbursement through the end of the following year, which using this example would be the end of 2024. Okay, we're going to switch gears and go on to HSA eligibility. And this is uh, a topic where we receive so many questions. Uh, so hopefully we can, can clarify some, some of the issues and confusion that sometimes arises with HSA eligibility. Let's start with the basics. To be HSA eligible, an individual must be covered by a qualified high deductible health plan have no other impermissible coverage, not be enrolled in Medicare, they cannot be claimed or even eligible to be claimed as a tax dependent of another. Important to keep in mind, HSA eligibility is normally determined as the first day of each calendar month. And the HSA eligible status of a spouse or other family member is not relevant. We receive that question often. Uh, my spouse enrolled in Medicare, you know, can I still contribute to an HSA? And the answer is yes, um, your spouse's eligibility, uh, ineligibility doesn't impact yours. Um, so that's a good point to keep in mind. Okay, let's, let's look at each of, each of these requirements, starting with the qualified 
high deductible health plan, um, each year there are limits uh, provided as far as the uh, out-of-pocket maximum um, and also the minimum deductible. We have the figures listed here for 2023. The 2024 figures were uh, just announced yesterday by the IRS. So uh, the minimum deductible uh, for 2024 is 1,600. Uh, for single coverage and 3,200 3, for family coverage. Family coverage, keep in mind, um, is anything other than single coverage, single plus one, uh, an entire family. Uh, the out-of-pocket maximum for 2024, 8,050 uh, and 16 for single coverage and 16,100 for family coverage. And the general rule, of course, is that no benefits can be paid until the minimum statutory deductible is met uh, with certain exceptions. Uh, and this list is not exhaustive, but we'll just go through some um, of the commonly used exceptions. Dental and vision expenses, uh, preventive care. Uh, this is a temporary one, COVID-19 testing and treatment expenses. Um, so that was provided under relief guidance. And the IRS recently announced that they'll allow that to continue uh, until further guidance is issued. And they did indicate that if that guidance is issued, they'll probably they'll try to do it so a plan doesn't have to make a change in mid-year, which is helpful. Um, telehealth services, now that is a popular exception, but unfortunately also temporary at this point. We started with the CARES Act, uh, the most recent extension was under the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023, which provided relief that applies to plan years beginning in 2023 and 2024. So unfortunately, the different relief measures have left some gaps, um, but we do have some relief currently under the CAA 2023. Uh, surprise billing protection payments um, can also be paid before the deductible is met without jeopardizing HSA eligibility. Other exceptions are insurance for a specific disease, such as cancer, or that pays a specific amount per period of hospitalization, uh, such as a hospital indemnity policy. We have to be very careful here. The IRS interprets the exceptions narrowly. If you're relying on one, you should make sure that you're falling squarely within that exception. Uh, and just a, a note I want to add here. Um, about drug coupons, because this is really an ongoing issue. The IRS has made very clear that drug coupons or any type of you know, manufacturer's assistance um, doesn't apply to the cost sharing limit. So what can be applied to the participant cost sharing limit is really only what the, the participant is actually paying or the, the individual is actually paying out of pocket. Um, the problem is that some state laws, some state insurance laws um, require any such drug coupons or assistance to be applied towards the deductible. So it creates this conflict for insured plans. Um, some of the state insurance laws do carve out HHPs um, so, so people can maintain their HSA eligibility, but many do not. So I think an employer in that situation really has to make sure they stay clear of offering any drug coupon or assistance to their employees because it could impact um, you know, the HGA, the qualified HGHP status. Okay, with all those exceptions, then you know, what could possibly go awry uh, with HSA eligibility? Well, there are a number of uh, types of coverage that are considered impermissible, and basically really any coverage that's not accepted um, that provides benefits before the HGHP deductible is met um, is problematic. Uh, this includes Medicare, any parts, and it's Medicare entitlement, not just eligibility. Uh, keep in mind, Medicare coverage can be retroactive. We would always advise an employee to check with Medicare as far as when their coverage will commence. Um, Medicaid is also impermissible coverage as is TRICARE, uh, receipt of VA medical benefits during the preceding three months, unless it's preventive care um, or care for a service-connected disability. 
and also VA medical or hospital care that's received by our veteran with a disability rating from the VA can be disregarded. That would be permissible. Continuing on here, general purpose HRA or health, SF, health FSA coverage is impermissible coverage. That includes coverage to a spouse. And keep in mind that most HRAs and health FSAs are designed to provide coverage for a spouse. So even if you don't seek reimbursement through your spouse's health FSA uh, for one of your expenses, you're still, still considered to be covered. Um, a grace period of carryover can further extend an ineligibility period uh, for a health FSA or HRA. A post-deductible or limited purpose uh, FSA or HRA is permitted, though. Uh, limited purpose would be, as an example, just covering dental or, and vision expenses. Uh, other problematic coverage, potentially an on-site medical clinic or an EAP, if they're deemed to provide significant medical benefits. So this is a facts and circumstances analysis. You know, some clinics and EAPs uh, may be permissible coverage, some may not. Um, it's really kind of a sub subjective analysis most employers would have to get their attorneys involved probably to assist um, to see if these benefits are, are the benefits provided are considered significant, thus rendering the coverage impermissible coverage for HSA eligibility purposes. Um, be careful also with hospital indemnity policies. A fixed amount payout per period or per day of hospitalization is generally permissible, but coverage that is service-based or provide significant other benefits, maybe x-ray, ambulance coverage may not be. And apparently some, some carriers have reached out and said, you know, our, our indemnity coverage is not HSA compatible, which is great that they're doing that, um, but perhaps not all, um, not all carriers are doing that. So um, you might wanna just be careful to check your policy. Uh, employers, generally an employer considering an HSA program should review each of their benefit offerings very carefully for HSA compatibility. I mentioned that um, an episode grace period or carrier can extend um, a period of HSA ineligibility. So let's just take a closer look at that. A grace period, of course, extends the FSA plan year by up to two and a half months to allow employees more time to incur claims. And the idea is to prevent them from from forfeiting their funds. We said that HSA eligibility is terminated on the first of the month. With the grace period then, the employee would not be HSA eligible until the first of the month after the grace period ends. So Rogers has a 2023 calendar year health FSA that has a two and a half month grace period. He would not be eligible to contribute to an HSA until April 1st of 2024 the first of the month after the grace period ends. However, if Roger spent down the FSA to zero as of the end of the 2023 year, that would be an exception and he would be HSA eligible as of the first of the year of 2024. Let's look at a carryover and a carryover of course allows an indexed amount. Um, it's really 20% of the electoral deferral amount for the year. So it's $610 for 2023 to be carried over from one year to the next. The FSA carryover will generally prevent HSA eligibility for the entire following plan year. So if Roger's plan is a carryover instead of a grace period, he would not be HSA eligible until January 1st of 2025. Um, however, a health FSA plan could be designed to convert the carryover balances to a limited purpose FSA let's say one just covering dental and vision, uh, for those who are electing the HSA or HDHP. Uh, the health FSA plan could also allow employees to waive or forfeit their carryover balances. And the plan would have to be amended um, to allow, allow for these features. Uh, so the, the rule, you know, the, the important thing to keep in mind um, is that, you know, employers, particularly if they're introducing in HDHP or HSA mid-year, they need to recognize the interaction of the existing health FSA coverage with a new offering. 
Uh, and offering an HSA is not a qualifying event that allows FSA participants to drop coverage. And finally, we'll wrap up HSA eligibility uh, with just uh, covering the employer obligations. What are the employer obligations to verify an employee's HSA eligibility? The employer is only responsible for determining whether that employee is covered by a high deductible health plan and has no disqualifying coverage sponsored by the employer. They're also responsible uh, for determining the employee's age, and that's just for catch-up contribution eligibility purposes. The employee really bears all other responsibility. However, the employer should monitor their benefit offerings uh, for HSA compat compatibility and should work with the HSA vendor to make sure employees are educated uh, regarding the eligibility requirements. It's not required, um, but it will certainly benefit all and help to avoid excess contributions. And with that, now that we've completed eligibility, we have uh, people elig eligible and ready to contribute. And I'll turn it over to Roger uh, to discuss the contribution rules. Uh, thank you, Carol. Um, that's absolutely correct. We did the first part, uh, who can be eligible, who can have these FSAs and HSAs. And now we're gonna talk about maybe the fun part, possibly, what we can do with them. So let's start off with uh, FSAs in terms of contributions, methods, limitations, and the ever popular use it or lose it rule. Um, obviously the main source of uh, contributions, uh, almost primarily across the board, salary reductions for health FSAs. Uh, they are of course subject to the use it or lose it rule. You, whatever you uh, elect there, if you don't use it at the end, the grace period or whatever it may be, <clears throat> it is uh, lost. Um, now that was once at one time back in the day, unlimited. Um, and a few years back changed uh, so that we have an IRS kind of a annual limit that's adjusted each year. That limit for plan year um, 2023 is $3,050. That limit applies also on a per employee basis. We get this question once in a while. If you have two spouses work for a uh, same employer, uh, they can each, if they wish, uh, elect up to that uh, limit. Uh, another rule applies to FSAs we are all familiar with is the irrevocable election rule. Uh, health FSAs are notoriously stingy about uh, uh, allowances for changing that election uh, mid-year. If you elect, for instance, $3,000 for plan year 2023, you are probably going to have that election the entire year unless one of these very few uh, exceptions apply. You'll notice that a few of the exceptions you may be used to for major medical plans and so forth, such as significant cost changes, changes in other employer plans and so forth, do not apply for health FSAs. Um, they just simply don't. It is one of the, probably the most stingy benefit in terms of uh, cafeteria plan salary reductions. Sometimes, not often, but it happens, uh, employers do make contributions to uh, health FSAs. These are also subject to the use it or lose it rule. Um, what those contributions can do, however, if they go over a certain amount is risk the FSA's accepted uh, benefit status, which Carol has uh, discussed earlier. You really don't want that. It was talked about. Um, it's a nice place to be for health FSA's. They're not subject to a lot of the <clears throat> rules and demand dates that apply to health plans in general. If you maintain that status as a general rule, cannot exceed $500 per plan year uh, from the employer contributions or a one-on-one -on -one match. Now, those contributions do not apply to that annual limit we just talked about, unless in that circumstance where the employee has a choice to elect it as cash or other taxable benefit rather than the FSA. The other form of contribution, and I use that term kind of loosely here, is the carryovers, of course, we talked about. That's really the one allowable exception to the use it or lose it rule. Um, it's uh, optional. Employers don't have to uh, put that as part of their uh, FSA, but they can. And of course, if they do, then we can't do grace period. Uh, and as Carol's already talked about, there's a $610 limit on that for carryovers from 2023 to 2024. That number does not count toward the annual limit we just talked about above. As we just pointed out, it has its own limit. So the third rule we love to talk about, everyone's favorite, the uniform coverage rule, right? We are all familiar with that one. The maximum reimbursement amount must be made available at all times during the plan year, regardless of the amount the employee has contributed, right? So let's use this example. We got Jerry. 
Jerry elects $3,000 for her FSA for playing year 2023, and that runs on a calendar year. What does that mean? That means Jerry has access to all $3,000 on January 1st, 2023, even though she may have made one contribution or not any yet, depending on the timing. And of course, you know, a lot of plan sponsored employers get a little wary of that. Oh, that's, you know, that's, that's just, you know, that's, that's not fair. That's a risk I have there. Or if you think about it, it really complements the user to lose it rule, right? I mean, if you're an employee, the user to lose it rule is kind of the downside, but the upside is the uniform coverage rule. If you're an employer, it's the other way around. Yes, there's the uniform coverage rule, but you get the forfeitures, you know, whatever's not used, it comes back to the plan. And uh, something I kind of talk about once in a while, and I will hear um, people, some folks who are kind of not familiar with FSAs get a little uh, focused, I guess, or over-focused on these two rules. And they just kind of, you know, oh, that seems very draconian. You know, we've got a uniform coverage rule, user rules it. Why is that the case? Take a step back. It's really no different than how insurance works, right? I mean, just if you strip away everything, basic health insurance for the plan year, with all, without all the bells and whistles, same kind of thing, right? You elect for the year, your major medical plan, you have a whole set of slew of benefits for the year. You may not use them all, but you have access to them from the first day, even though you've only made one premium. And uh, so it's the same deal. Uniform coverage rule, use it or lose it rules. These places were put in place largely to kind of mimic how insurance works. So if you kind of look at it that way, you'll see these rules are really not unusual. People just kind of get hung up on them a little bit because it's just money in an account. But it's no different, generally speaking, than how insurance in general works. The next slide, speaking of which, this is a popular one. Um, <clears throat> this happens all the time, right? Occasionally, well, maybe not all the time, but it happens. Terminated FSA participants. Uh, Kendall is terminated from employment after having spent more from his FSA than he contributed. That stinker, how could he do that? Um, can the employer make up the difference from Kendall's final paycheck? This comes up a lot. Some people look at it again, they get so hyper-focused on that one account. The answer is no. That violates the uniform coverage rule. You can't do that. Okay, it's 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 all right. And if you look at all the numbers, there are, generally speaking are many more experience gains overall than experience losses. Once in a while, there may be one loss like this, but overall, if you look at it all as a big overall pile uh, altogether, you'll see that FSAs almost always have experience gains. Again, what does that sound like? It sounds like how insurance works. It's the same sort of thing, but no, you cannot do that no matter how fair it seems or whatever. And in fact, you may have a COBRA obligation as I was talked about earlier. Well, not in this case, because we had the oversight, but you know what I mean. Regardless, HSA contribution rules. Let's go to them. Uh, FSAs are pretty easy. We talked about those three main rules. HSA annual maximum contribution limits. I do want to thank the IRS for the perfect timing of doing this this week. They must have known we were doing this, and you can see the new numbers, and they are uh, substantially higher uh, than they were last year <clears throat> because of the cost of living increases and so forth. So for 2024, we have $4,150 for single coverage and $8,300, exactly double of the other, as always, for family. In HSA world, there are only two kinds of tiers of coverage. There's one-person coverage and not one person coverage or self only and non self only doesn't matter if it's employee child employee spouse family whatever there's just one person and family those are the two things and the contributions are adjusted accordingly these limits apply on a calendar year basis regardless of the hdhp plan year um hsas occasionally will mimic iras in some ways sometimes they're called an ira for your health that's not completely inaccurate it's a fair assessment <clears throat> overall and as with some IRAs, they have catch-up contributions. So do HSAs. Uh, people aged uh, 55 or older are eligible for an additional $1,000 catch-up contribution on top of these limits. Uh, that limit includes all contributions to the uh, HSA, depending where, no matter where they come from. If an employer makes one, that applies to the limit, as does the employee. The deadline for contributions is the tax day of the following year. Uh, you have for 2023, for instance, uh, you can make your contributions all the way up to the tax day, which is usually April 15th. Some years it moves a little bit uh, of 2024. That annual contribution limit, we're talking about annual and years and so forth, is subject to proration. Um, and the proration is a monthly proration. Mm -hmm. We talked about eligibility for HSAs. When you get to strip it all down, really, HSA eligibility is about two basic things. It's about the ability to establish an HSA and the ability to contribute 
to an HSA and a corollary to that, how much. Those are the two main things that eligibility is about and it's measured as of the first of each month. So if you are HSA eligible on June 1st, you are deemed HSA eligible for all of the rest of June. Let's look at a quick example here. We got Logan, he enrolls in self only himself, HDHB coverage, which begins on January 1st, 2023. Moves along through the year, but then he enrolls in Medicare when he reaches age 65, and that coverage begins on July 1st. Both Logan's self-only HDHB coverage and his Medicare coverage continue through the end of 2023. Some people, maybe even Logan, I don't know, may have thought, well, gosh, I, I had uh, HDHB coverage all year. I should be able to make a full year's contribution. No, he was only eligible for the first six months because even though he had HDHB coverage in the second half of the year, he also had quote unquote, impermissible coverage, this Medicare coverage, impermissible in terms of HSA for the second half of the year. So he was HSA eligible for six twelfths or one half of the 2023 calendar year, six months out of 12. And so he can put in one half of the annual maximum. He is also old enough to put in a catch up. So if he did that, that would also be prorated as well. Let's suppose he moves in to the year toward the end and he didn't know that and then somebody's like hey logan you know you you're you weren't eligible for these last couple of months you put in too much what does what can logan do well he can remove the excess uh in this case one thousand nine hundred and twenty five dollars as long as he does that prior to the tax filing deadline for uh, 2023 which again would be april 15th next year he, uh, he will be fine. The, the, these rules are fairly forgiving so long as you catch things in time. Uh, but if he doesn't, he's going to owe a 6% excise tax on those excess amounts. So here's a little alternative. The full contribution, also known as the last month rule, uh, when HSAs first were passed about 20 years ago, a little complaint out there in employer land was, gosh, we would love to have these high deductible health plans, but we operate kind of on a fiscal year in the middle of the year. And we don't want to start up people like in July and not be able to do a full year's contribution with these deductibles. So one of the things they kind of adjusted during, uh, I guess we call it HSA uh, version point, uh, 1.2 a couple of years later, was allow for the ability to make a full year's contribution for a year as long as you were eligible on December 1st of that year, provided that you were also HSA eligible for the entire next calendar year. Okay, that's kind of nice, uh, but it does have that stipulation in it. So let's look at somebody, Siobhan. Siobhan enrolls your family in HDHP coverage on November 1st, later on this year. I'm predicting the future, I guess. She does that and makes the full family contribution to her HSA for 2023 because she's like, yeah, I love this HSA. This HDHP is great. I'm going to be eligible all next 2024. It's all going to be good. Well, as long as she does that, all's well. Uh, she, she remains HSA eligible through the end of 2024. All good. If not, though, something happens, who knows, she doesn't become eligible, she gets non-HDHP coverage, whatever, then her 2023 contribution is going to be prorated to two twelfths, right, because it was only November, December, uh, or one sixth of the total amount, and she'll be subject to income taxes and uh, additional 10% penalty tax on the contributions accounting for January through October of 2023. Employer contribution rules. Um, employers do not have to make any contributions to HSAs. Um, many do, of course, especially if they're offering an HDHP plan. Uh, if they do, uh, they do count toward the applicable maximum limit. We already talked about that. And they are usually non-forfeitable. You don't get them back. You can't, it's not a loan. Once it's in the account, in almost all cases, we'll talk about the few exceptions in a minute, um, it's now the account holders. Uh, they can be, quote unquote, front loaded early in the year. Uh, that's fine. Uh, some employers are like, look, especially if it's a new transitional to these high deductible, we'll put it all in or a lot at the beginning. Now, if the employee terminates employment or the HDHP coverage mid-year, the employer can't reach back and recoup the funds. So that's a little bit of a, quote unquote, risk, although they still get the deduction and everything. But whether you want to do it front loaded, periodic or whatever, that's completely up to the employer. Uh, if employer wants to make very direct employer contributions, there are a a slew of these very restricted, rigid comparability rules, right? Uh, that they say you do this, you, you have to treat these people the same, do this, and all these very restrictive rules. And some people were like, well, is there a way we don't have to do that? And the IRS was like, well, yeah, if you let them do it through a, make their contributions to a cafeteria plan, then you don't have to do these. So everybody was like, yeah, well, let's do that. And that's what most employers do. They say, um, like, go ahead and make your contributions 
through uh, as part of a benefit in the Section 125 plan, and then you don't have to worry about these comparability rules. Uh, the the uh, little myth that's out there sometimes is people hear that and they think, oh, there are no rules. Well, there are, and they're the Section 125 non-discrimination rules that we've talked about earlier. So, but uh, they're obviously much more uh, flexible or in terms of like what you can do with contributions than the standard contra uh, comparability rules. The one big thing to remember is employees should, must be permitted to change their HSA elections at least monthly. You can't lock them in. They should be able to increase and decrease as they please. Can an employer recoup a mistaken HSA contribution? As we've talked about a few times, uh, once the employer makes that contribution and goes into the account holder's account, it's it's pretty much gone. I mean, it's theirs. It's now the account holders. They, it, it's not a subject to conditions. You know, as I said, it's not a loan. Very limited exceptions. Suppose the individual was never HSA eligible. Maybe clear and convincing evidence of a fairly serious administrative or process error, mistakenly contributing more than the statutory maximum. Those are very limited. You have to jump through a lot of hoops to show that. And any recruitment uh, <clears throat> when the, one of these limited exception applies must be made by the end of the tax year. So they're there, but very, very limited. Once you employer or an employer make that uh, contribution, it's now the account holders and end of story there. All right, distribution. Talk about how to put the money in. What do we do when we get them out? So we're gonna start with FSAs. Basic FSA distribution rules. Um, what are FSAs? Well, they're basically designed to reimburse participants. We all know this, right? For expenses incurred for medical care as defined in code section 213D. Uh, we like to talk about that. If you're you know, looking for some really exciting reading material, might I recommend IRS publication 502. It is fascinating. It's just great. The character development is amazing. It's like a glossary. Everything's alphabetical. All the things you can use of uh, uh, your FSA for, or, or as qualified medical expenses <clears throat> for itemized deductions. One biggie it does list that is not eligible as an FSA expense are insurance premiums. Can't use FSAs for those, but we all know out-of-pocket expenses, pre-deductible expenses, co-payments, co-insurance, dental and vision costs, all the goodies that we're used to. One piece of good news that I guess in a way we can thank COVID for, I suppose, is the return back to the future of the ability to use your FSAs for over-the-counter medications. Uh, when FSAs first began, that was a big no-no. Early in the aughts, I guess we call it, uh, all of a sudden it was okay, you could do it. And then they changed it back and said, well, you can only do it if you get a doctor's prescription. So that kind of ruins the whole over-the-counter fun. But as part of the CARES Act a couple of years ago, uh, OTC, over-the-counter medications are back as an eligible expense for FSAs. And that looks like to be as about as permanent as it's gonna get. There is no end on that. And hopefully that will uh, continue. Employers can tailor their FSAs to cover fewer types of expenses than are otherwise allowable. That's not very common, except in circumstances where employers want to make, say, a dental FSA or a vision FSA, usually to have some compatibility uh, with uh, HSA eligibility. And these expenses uh, can be incurred by the employee and spouses and dependents. I'm not going to get into the weeds about who's a dependent and who's not. That's a, that's for another uh, story. But the usual folks, uh, we'll put it that way, and you can use your FSA for that. Double dipping is prohibited. You cannot use your FSA to reimburse yourself for something that's already been reimbursed by someone else. In terms of timing, uh, it's for medical expenses incurred over the period of coverage. Usually that's a plan year, 12 months, right? Uh, if there's a grace period, after that plan year, well, that's another two and a half months, but it has to be incurred during that time. And of course, FSAs will have a run out period of some time after that, where you can do some claims toward the end, but you can't run to your employer, you know, for something that happened five years ago and be like, whew, I totally forgot about this $20 claim. Can I get this? No, the run out period's far over. There's a certain amount of time you got to get it in there for the reimbursement. There are two methods. The usual ones are the tried and true reimbursements. We love that one, right? You pay the doctor, then you go and get your claim, you get your money back. And we also love electronic payment cards. Uh, they've been around for about 20, 25 years now. Very convenient. You don't have to front your money. Uh, and if they're auto adjudicated, even more so. But 
still subject to substantiation rules where they're not auto adjudicated. And what tends to happen is every few years, somebody goes to the IRS and says, hey, are we still doing that thing where we have to like substantiate all our claims if there's no auto adjudication? We, you're still into that? Um, could we sample or maybe employees who are really cool and we trust them, we don't have to worry about it or if it's a certain amount, are you still making us do that? And the IRS considers those questions and a few months later they answer, Yes, we're still making you do that. That's just the way it is. All claims must be substantiated. And in fact, just a few weeks ago in March, this happened again. Uh, we talked about it <clears throat> in the compliance corner last week. All claims must be substantiated one way or the other. So for HSAs, pretty much the same universe of expenses. Um, a couple of differences. Uh, tax dependent, you know, we're, we're, by this point, we're all used to the age 26 rule, right? With tax dependent, it took about 10 years, but we're used to it. HSA rules do not incorporate that particular rule. It just didn't get tucked in there. Long story why, it doesn't really matter. But uh, generally speaking, you can use your HSA for yourself, your spouse's independence, but not up to age 26. This is for us old timers, the ones we're used to, right? Children under age 19 or under age 24 and a full time student. Uh, again, this is the same publication 502 gives you a general overview, but in some cases, unlike FSAs, some insurance premiums and coverage are eligible, limited cases. Uh, some continuation coverage, you can see it there. Maintenance of a health plan while receiving unemployment <clears throat> and health insurance of the Medicare SUP, uh, if 65 or over. And in a few cases, long-term care insurance with age-based limitations, but no substantiation per se. The HSA account holder is in charge, but what does that mean? The account holder is a taxpayer. So you are accountable for what you spend and making sure you comply with the rules. Speaking of which, we'll go next. To distribution timing, the uh, couple of big ones here, establishment rule. Uh, you can use your HSA for expenses, but only if they've been incurred after an HSA has been established, okay? One helpful thing is that if you had a prior HSA and you had a positive balance in that HSA within the last 18 months, then if you have a new HSA, the establishment date of that prior one can be uh, the establishment date for your new ones that cover some gaps there. That's a little useful. Uh, you can see an example there with somebody who opened up one in 2021. So long as that was the deal, you can have that new establishment uh, date or that old establishment date for your new one. Uh, big deal here for HSAs. I like to say HSAs are one of the most uh, 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 generous tax uh, benefits there. They just are the way it was designed. Shoebox rule, which is a little outdated now, right, during this day and age, but you can use your HSA distributions for a medical expense and they can get them at any future time. There are no run out periods for HSAs. You want to do it 10 years later? Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. You can, so long as you have your records, the expense is a qualified medical expense, not previously reimbursed by any other source and was not taken as an itemized tax deduction in any prior taxable rear. Remember, these account holders, if you're an account holder, you're a taxpayer. You've got to keep your records. Oh, do I have to keep them for a long time? Hey, you got pictures in your phone of people you can't even recognize from 10 years ago. You can keep these records. It's good. It's a good benefit. It'll help. And you can also take a distribution for medical expenses incurred after you're not even eligible for an HSA anymore. That's pretty good. Eligibility is about contributions only and, and the ability to establish. If Even if you're not eligible later, you can still use your money in HSA for a qualified medical expense. Just about done with my part. Tax treatment of HSA distributions, really three categories. No taxation, free and clear for qualified medical expenses. Just put in taxable income um, for non-qualified medical expenses after you've reached 65 or uh, have, have a level of disability. Remember, there's a little bit of a rough uh, alignment with uh, some IRA rules. Or the big one, you don't want to do this, taxable and penalized. Come on, you don't need to do that. It's a good deal. Just keep it in there. But any other distribution will be taxable as income and subject to the 20% excise tax. Those special situations are pretty basic. We're not wor going to worry about those. We will look at one more FAQ. And that FAQ is going to be about um, the non-qualified expenses. Um, and what? how do you do that? Well, gosh, can I just do it and not tell anybody? No, you can't. You're a taxpayer. Come on, do this right. If you take it out if for a non-qualified expense, you're going to have to report that on Form 8889, which all health savings account holders, generally speaking, ought to file, which is just kind of an accounting. And you'll have to pay, put in your taxable income and pay that 20% uh, excise tax. And that's reported on that uh, tax form for that year. However, you have until April 15th, that tax date to correct that if it is an issue. As I said, these rules are very forgiving. So 
long as you get them in time and uh, generally speaking, a pretty good deal. And with that, my end with the contributions and distributions are completed and I'm gonna give it back to Carol. Well, thank you so much, Roger, for that um, comprehensive and, and rather animated presentation of the Health FSA and HSA contribution and distribution rules. Uh, we just wanna leave with some final takeaways uh, for our audience. Uh, with respect to the Health FSA, um, health FSAs, as we said, can provide significant tax savings to employees and employers. Um, however, they are employer-sponsored group health plans, so they're subject to um, all the group health plan laws. Employers determine eligibility uh, and should keep the ACA's footprint rule uh, and non-discrimination rules in mind. Employers should also be mindful of that uniform coverage rule. Uh, participants should be mindful of the use it or lose it rule as well as grace periods or carryover options, if any, to prevent forfeitures. Uh, and employers and employees should understand uh, the impact and interaction of SSA, FSA coverage on HSA eligibility. As far as uh, the HSA compliance takeaways, uh, they also have great tax advantages and can help employees pay for qualifying medical expenses. Employees own the accounts. They're ultimately responsible for complying with eligibility, contribution, and distribution rules. Employee education can be very helpful. Uh, employers should plan proactively uh, when implementing an HSA, uh, particularly for the first time. Work with your HSA vendor uh, so the process and communications are clear and coordinated. Uh, verify employees are not covered by impermissible coverage through the employer. Uh, consider funding employer contributions throughout the year rather than a lump sum that may help to avoid an excess contribution. Um, perform, and this would be for, for the health of SA and HSA, you want to perform a non-discrimination testing early in the year. Um, you really need to do mid-year testing because if you wait till the end of the year, it's too late to make any corrections. Um, we do have a great publication uh, on HSA, so uh, please reach out to your NFP contact if you would like a copy of that. And uh, that brings us to the conclusion of, of our presentation. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, Beth, do we have any questions? It looks like we have a few minutes um, sure. before we turn it back to Amber. Sure, I'd love to ask a couple of questions if you don't mind. Um, just to make it crystal clear, we did see a couple of questions about the dynamic where I, let's say as the employee, have access to an HSA, but my spouse has an FSA, or vice versa. Can you help us understand and just make it very clear when one of the spouses having an FSA is going to be a problem for the spouse who wants to have an HSA? Sure. Yeah, it's it's almost always a problem because your typical health FSA or an HRA is designed to cover expenses not just of the employee, but also of the employee's spouse. They could technically be drafted like those documents to exclude coverage for a spouse, but that's that's normally not done. Um, so so basically, you know, if if you have if your spouse is covered by a health FSA um, or HRA, I mean, then then you most likely are not going to be eligible to contribute to an HSA. You can always inquire, you know, but um, you know, almost all health deficits and nature rays are going to provide coverage for a spouse. Um, so that would be problematic. Thank you for that. Um, and then another question that we got that I thought was good on HSAs um, has to do with an employer's obligation to actually, you know, help the employee understand whether or not they're eligible for an HSA, right? Um, often, you know, the employer would know, for example, if the person chooses a PPO at their company, that that person is not eligible for an HSA. But let's say that the employer doesn't know that the employee is enrolled on their spouse's PPO or doesn't know um, that the employee um, has some other, let's say, you know, TRICARE coverage or something. What would you say is the employer's obligation in that regard to help employees understand their eligibility for the HSA? Right. I think we tried to, to state that, you know, technically the employer is not responsible, right? They're responsible for making sure they're covered by, you know, that, that HGHP uh, and, and don't have any impermissible coverage with the employer, but they don't know what, what other coverage the employer may have outside, you know, of that employment context. Um, but, I, and I think that's really where it comes to education. 
Um, our whole team knows all the questions we get. Oh, you know, you just you didn't realize, you know, they enrolled in Medicare. It was retroactive. They were covered by the health FSA, HRA. And then inevitably, you know, you, you end up with an excess contribution, you know, that, that needs to be removed from the account. And then it's, you know, complicated with the, the tax aspects. If it's not done timely, there can be penalties, um, all of which is unnecessary if there had just been employee education. So, you know, while a situation where it's not employer provided coverage, the employer is technically not responsible. Um, you know, I think everybody just benefits greatly by educating employees um, on, on those eligibility requirements. Thank you. And then could you also kind of just help us understand the idea of the HSA and the 13 month rule? Because I know we got a couple questions about that where I think people didn't quite follow what that concept was. Are you referring to the full contribution rule? Is yes. That right. Yes. Okay, sure. Um, and and you, you may not see this as much in the employment context, but, um, and I don't know if, if Roger, do you want to address that, Roger? I know you had Sure, and things. I will probably, one of the reasons why I was a little, probably follow, follow a little bit as I probably uh, zoomed through that a bit. Um, essentially, uh the the it, it's to help folks who start uh, start being hsa eligible in the middle of the year um in the middle of a calendar year so uh people want to put in their full contribution right but it used to be they couldn't so what they did establish this rule of like if you are hsa eligible on december 1st of a calendar year uh but you were not for the entire year you can can put act as though you were HSL eligible for that entire calendar year and put in the whole thing. So long as you continue to be HSA eligible for the entire next calendar year. The term is 13 year testing period. That sounds very technical. Really, it just means, hey, if you want to be treated as though you were HSA eligible this entire calendar year that you weren't, you got to be eligible the entire next calendar year. Otherwise, you're going to have to make some adjustments with term with taxes. I hope that helps a little bit. Fantastic. Um, lots of questions about the HSA. I'm going to throw in one there about the FSA. Can mm -hmm. either of y'all think of a situation out there where <laughs> someone might overspend their FSA and the employer can get the money back? <laughs> if, uh, I, I mean, maybe on the very off chance if there were the over one of the expenditures was ineligible or something although you'd have to chase it down but no under basically there's no situation um it's they are designed to be uh the, the uniform coverage rule is there i mean you know it's it's you can't chase it down you can you know there's unless there was some sort of uh, i don't know as i said an accident or ineligible which would be very unusual generally speaking no it's uniform coverage rule you're allowed to quote unquote overspend um, just as they could be. And I do like to use this analogy with regular insurance. Some people once in a while end up having a lot more in claims than they put in in premiums and they get, you know, you don't chase it down. That's just sort of the way it works. Thank you. Yeah, that was absolutely the answer I was looking for, which is like, no, split <laughs> usually means the employer. Yeah. That's the risk that comes with an FSA for the employer. Yeah. Which um, is usually offset by, as we said, experience gains overall. If, the, if people absolutely. lost a lot of money on these things, they wouldn't be offering them. And employers should also remember there's a lot of savings in terms of the payroll taxes on the employer side, too. They should always put those in as well. They generally are a net gain for employers and participants. Absolutely. And then with 30 seconds left, those experience gains on the FSA, what is it appropriate for the employer to do with that money? Carol, you want that one? Or? Did y'all even go into that? Sure. Well, there's it, it, first of all, they should look to the, the plan document. There's a number of specified uses for it. Um, mm -hmm. It could be used to, to offset certain plan expenses. That's probably the most common use for it. Um, it it can, can't it can be um, returned to participants, but I want to be clear here, like it's not based on claims, right? It could be a, a, like a, a pro rata type formula. We don't see that too often. Um, I think, as I said, most common, it's used to cover the, the, the plan expenses. Um, but I would advise anybody to, to review their plan document um, to see if it specifies and then it, there's any ordering as to how those funds can be used. Thank you, Amber. I think we'll turn it over to you uh, for your outro. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. 
To reiterate, today's presentation was recorded. We will be sharing the recording in the follow-up email and on the NFP website. If there are any portions of this call that you missed, by Monday, you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At the end of this call, a survey will populate in a new window. Please take a brief moment to complete the survey as it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps make our education program as current and relevant as possible. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.